The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, an inspiring message after a massive stroke. Everything is going to be okay in the end. Plus, a plea to save a marriage that fell on deaf ears. I remember this voice in my head saying, good luck with that. Then, they said it's Seth, something happened. A freak accident tears the arm off a 12-year-old. Said, I want to die. I'm a baseball player. I'm a pitcher. How he survived. I didn't realize his faith was so strong. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Let's go over to the CBN newsroom for today's top stories. Gordon, President Trump is just days away from announcing his choice for U.S. Supreme Court. Already, two of his potential nominees are under fire from members of Congress and the media, one for not being conservative enough and the other for her Christian views. Gary Lane has the story. It was a star-spangled July 4th celebration at the White House Wednesday night as the president considered his Supreme Court pick. Such an important decision, and we're going to give you a great one like Justice Gorsuch. Uh, we, uh, we hit a home run there, and we're going to hit a home run here. The president has a list of seven possible candidates to replace retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy. But some members of Congress and the media say the president is striking out with two candidates on his short list. The two under fire are federal appeals court judges Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. Kavanaugh is opposed by three Republican senators for making comments like this one when he said judges need to keep an open mind. It means a willingness to change your mind. That's something that judges have to do to say, well, I didn't look at it that way a few years ago, but now I see that it looks different to me. Senators Rand Paul, Tom Cotton, and Ted Cruz fear that comment indicates Kavanaugh won't stick with the view that the Constitution means what it says. As for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, liberals are trying to smear her for her faith. She's a committed, faithful Christian who's part of a Roman Catholic group called People of Praise. Some on the left are trying to label it a cult because its members are so committed to their faith. Senator Dianne Feinstein infamously introduced a religious test during Barrett's federal appeals court confirmation hearing. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly. But Barrett supporters say she's just like millions of other committed American Christians. And she's an outstanding jurist who once clerked for Justice Scalia and a mother of seven, including a special needs child and two children born in Haiti. Democrats like hardball host Chris Matthews warn they must do whatever they can to stop Trump's Supreme Court nominee. The president says he'll announce his pick on Monday. Gary Lane, CBN News. Is socialism the future of the Democratic Party? Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez is praising the socialist candidate who recently won a New York Democratic primary. He says Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez represents, quote, the future of our party. She defeated one of the top leaders of the Democrats in Congress in that primary. Ocasio-Cortez wants to abolish ICE, the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and she is not the only prominent socialist associated with the Democratic Party. Senator Bernie Sanders, one of the top candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination in 2016, is a socialist as well. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is visiting North Korea to meet with Kim Jong-un. It comes as some people are asking, what is North Korea really up to? After his June 12th summit with Kim, President Trump said there was no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. But new satellite images may tell a different story, indicating the regime is making improvements to its nuclear facilities. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Gonzalez has this story. A monitoring group tells CBN News the North Korean government appears to be finalizing the expansion of a major ballistic missile manufacturing plant. Researchers say the plan has grown considerably since a summit took place between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Some of the projects that had started a couple of months ago um, now seem to be externally complete um, and would help improve the performance of the 5 megawatt reactor, the plutonium production reactor at Yongbyon. 38 North research analyst Jenny Town said it was done at a rapid pace. 
She says some of the work took place after the June 12 Singapore summit, after Kim promised to denuclearize. During his annual New Year's speech, Kim ordered his country's missile and nuclear weapons research sectors to mass-produce ballistic missiles. Since then, Kim has been on a diplomatic push. National Security Advisor John Bolton told CBS's Face the Nation that no one involved in the North Korean discussions is naive and says a plan is in place. We have developed a program. I'm sure that uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo will be discussing this with the North Koreans in the near future about uh, really how to dismantle all of their WMD and ballistic missile programs in a year. Town says we must remember nothing's been agreed to just yet. The summit was merely to set an agenda. They did pledge to um, put a moratorium on nuclear and missile testing, which they have done. They did pledge to dismantle some of the testing infrastructure, which they have done. And so, you know, and that was all done pre-agreement. President Trump remains optimistic. Oh, I think they're very serious about it. I think they want to do We had a very good chemistry. Meanwhile, Pentagon officials tell CBN News the U.S. maintains a high state of readiness. I'll leave it up to the to our diplomats at the State Department uh, to continue uh, the, the work that uh, they started at the summit. The, the mantra there, uh, ready to fight tonight, uh, does not change. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. One of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world is experiencing a crisis, one that could define its future for generations to come. As Chris Mitchell reports, it's an ongoing battle between today's culture and traditional Christianity. The face of the church around the world is changing, literally. The leadership of the global church, without doubt, has passed on to the global south. and. Africans are taking a lead, and this is a cause for great celebration. It's not the white man, or it's a religion of the Middle East, it's a religion of Africa, it's a religion of Asia. So for me, this is absolutely encouraging. During this recent gathering of Anglicans in Jerusalem, it became clear one of the world's largest Protestant denominations is refocusing efforts to spread God's word to the nations. What's so encouraging is that we have many people here from Africa or Asia. These uh, countries only received the message of the gospel 150 or 200 years ago. They uh, have believed the gospel, they remained faithful, and now God has sent them to us, especially in the West, to remind us that we must return to our gospel roots. People in the U.S. would recognize the Episcopal Church as part of the Anglican Communion. The goal of this Jerusalem meeting was to create a roadmap for the future of this church body. It began in 2008 to uphold traditional church teaching and emphasize the critical importance of the Bible. Archbishop Stanley Antigali from Uganda believes this group exists to maintain the purity of the gospel. It's all about Jesus, all about mission, evangelism, preaching the biblical gospel so that we do not divert from the biblical truth. We remain focused on the Bible, the authority of the Bible, the teaching of Jesus Christ. Members of this conference oppose the liberal teachings in some Western Anglican churches that embrace same-sex marriage and homosexuality. Those teachings led Archbishop Nicholas Oko from Nigeria to call on the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leader of the Anglican Church, to repent. We would like him to know that a big chunk of people he's leading are complaining very badly about his direction, his trajectory. And so we would like him to change. That is to say that they must make a definite stand of repentance. Representatives here address differences with those leaders and churches in a letter calling them schismatics who have departed from the teaching of the Bible and the historic doctrine of the church. We must return to being faithful to Jesus despite what the culture is telling us. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Catherine Wolf was just 26 years old when she suffered a massive brainstem stroke that nearly killed her. Against all odds, she survived. And as strange as it sounds, she says that what happened to her has actually made her life better and her faith deeper. 
Catherine and her husband Jay shared their amazing story with CBN's Abigail Robertson. You might think a near fatal stroke in the prime of her life would have made Catherine Wolf bitter, but that's far from the case. Young suffering is pretty awesome because, and not in the moment, but long after you see the beautiful ways it has enhanced your life. As crazy as that sounds. Catherine and her husband Jay are sharing that outlook with a ministry in the book, highlighting the remarkable ways hope in Christ can heal your life. It's tragic in our world. Everybody is so bitter about everything that's happened to them and so beat up by the world and truly so broken by it. And the reality is in my story, in the gospel story, and in all stories, in my opinion, there is a beautiful opportunity for redemption and for turning our bitterness into a deep gratitude. Arriving at this point, however, meant taking a long, hard journey with many bumps along the way. As newlyweds, life looked pretty great. Jay was almost finished with law school, Catherine was getting modeling jobs, and they had a beautiful newborn baby. Then, the stroke hit. We rushed her to the hospital, um, at UCLA Hospital, and they determined she was having a massive brainstem stroke, and it was caused by this rare uh, genetic malformation in her brain near her brainstem. Such a severe um, stroke that they really didn't know if she would even be able to do surgery, much less if she would live. Even with that prognosis, doctors performed 16 hours of surgery that included removing part of Catherine's brain in an attempt to save her life. The next day, doctor came out, said she had survived, but they didn't know if she would ever wake up or if she would be veg veg vegetative or paralyzed. And um, by God's grace, just surely but surely, she began waking up and just communicating that she was still inside. Catherine still faced a harsh reality. She couldn't walk, talk, or eat, and half of her face was paralyzed. Here I am, 26 years old, a new mother, I mean, barely out of the newlywed phase of life. And now I'm being told, like, essentially your life is shot, it's over, and there's no hope kind of thing. And the reality is, I knew on a deep level that they weren't right. Despite that intuition, the chances of regaining her abilities appeared slim, as did the survival of their marriage. In the hospital, Jay and the family learned 90% of couples their age divorced following a medical crisis to one spouse. About two months into my ordeal, a well-meaning social worker told my father-in-law that he needed to get his son out of there, that the hospital grind was too much, that under 30-year-olds could never stay married through this kind of tragedy. Jay's dad suggested a trip to Yosemite, but Jay refused, determined to wait for Catherine. His dad told the social worker they'd wait on the trip, and he thought their marriage would turn out just fine. We're grateful that we can be a team. And and from the, from the first day of our life taking this dramatically different course. Um, God has just given us this sense that we're doing it together. After months in the hospital, Catherine's healing defied predictions, one miracle at a time. As things progressed, Catherine moved into a rehabilitation center. When we entered into this next longer term phase of recovery at Brain Rehab, it was pretty shocking to be in and among this community of people who are all in the worst place in their whole life. Jay and their son lived nearby, while Catherine had to stay with the other patients. Even in those surroundings, Catherine and Jay saw an opportunity. I felt like this holy burden to really love them, come alongside them, just provide a different voice than the ones they were hearing, and just really share for me the, the hope and faith that I felt, that everything is going to be okay in the end. While not everyone took kindly to her approach, she remained determined. They weren't going to inform my attitude about my recovery. I was going to inform their attitude about recovery, which was, we're going to overcome. Against all odds, Catherine improved enough to go home to her family, and they finally took that trip to Yosemite. You can go through the ringer again and again, 
And the one thing we know for sure is that God was faithful before, and He will be again. And we've seen that every time, that as bad as we've had post-stroke things happen, we can always look back and remember and say, oh yeah, God was there working every second of that out. Remarkably, seven years after the stroke, Catherine and Jay welcomed a new son to the family, John Nestor Wolf, named after the neurosurgeon who helped save Catherine's life. By all medical odds, there's no reason John should be in this world. And so to just have a picture of such grace in his life and to, to again be reminded that God's plan and purpose for us, even in the midst of our great tragedy, is, is a good purpose for His glory. And it's, it's just a daily reminder to lean into that hope. And as part of that plan, they're spreading the word through their book, ministry, and a summer camp for other people with special needs. So we're really excited to sort of enter into a, a new season of being able to take, again, the comfort that we've received, the resources and the community that have just championed us, and to give that to other families in need. Their positivity through it all is inspiring people all over the world. Catherine and Jay plan to write another book, and there may even be an upcoming movie on their life about how they learned through their experience to redefine healing and manifest hope instead. Hope in Christ has healed my soul, and that's the ultimate healing we all need anyway. Well, absolutely amazing story. The Wolf's book is called Hope Heals, and you can find links to their book, their ministry, and their summer camp for people with special needs. All you have to do is go to cbnnews.com. Terry? Well, coming up, a marriage on the rocks and a wife who's convinced she can fix her man. I realized it was a problem when, when he would drink every single day. I told him I could fix this. And I remember to this day, like this voice in my head saying, good luck with that. See what does make over their marriage after this. When Yolanda Jackson realized her husband Billy had a drinking problem, she figured she could fix him. After all, this was the second marriage for both of them, and she felt she had to make it work. But all her efforts just made it worse. I realized it was a problem when, when he would drink every single day. I was very controlling. Um, I was very selfish. So I just figured I could fix him and make him what I want him to be. I told him I could fix this. And I remember to this day, like this voice in my head saying, good luck with that. Billy and Yolanda were both Christians who each had gone through divorce. They began dating after they met in church. I gave Yolanda my phone number. I said, can you call me? We can go out to dinner. She said, sure. I was really attracted to his smile and his genuine spirit. Yolanda was a gift, was a blessing from God. When they married, they became a blended family and looked forward to a new start in life. But over the years, Billy's addiction to alcohol stirred up argument after argument. Drinking began to be a little bit heavier for me when I got into the military. It was relaxing me. It was taking me away from a lot of reality I was going through. I figured it was something I liked doing and I could stop anytime. He'll tell me he'll stop. The next day, I'll find a bottle or he'll be drinking. So he tried to hide it. I would find bottles under chairs, in the uh, pantry, out in the garage. I would find them everywhere. Billy always managed to sober up before Sunday so they could attend church together. But Yolanda, the pastor's daughter, was struggling to find peace. I was really good at putting on the church face, but I felt like something was still missing. Four years, I went on this soul-searching journey. Help and hope and, um, and peace, that's really what I was searching for. I went with a friend to a meditation retreat. I went to breathing coaches. I just went through all these own experiences, especially being in the spa business. None of that really helped find who, who I was searching for. Overwhelmed and desperate, Yolanda realized she had neglected her relationship with God. Although she had prayed, she never took time to listen. I didn't really trust God. I would go figure it out after I prayed. Call somebody, ask somebody for it. You know, just go and do it without waiting on Him. 
She called her husband from work and told him she needed time alone. She checked in at a bed and breakfast for the weekend to study the Bible and pray with no interruptions. Then, in the presence of God, she surrendered everything. Those anger issues I had, the controlling I had, the stress, I had to prove myself to people. I had to turn that over to the Lord. So I wrote that stuff down and I took all of those things that were on that sheet of paper and I tore that, those sheet of paper up in little bitty pieces, right? And I put it in the fireplace and I burned it. I burned all of those sheets and that's when I said, I'm not gonna pick it back up, to, up again. I was releasing all of these things. My heart was being mended back together. And this may not make sense, but I told God that I would stop dreaming. Because when I would dream, I would try to control the outcome of that dream. I would try to tell God, this is how I want it. This is what I want to do. So the only way I knew how to turn it over to him was to just say, God, you take this. After a couple days, Yolanda returned home. And she comes through the door, hugs me, says, hi. You know, I had a great time. Hi, the kids. It was a Yolanda that I'd never seen before. In addition to not arguing, I, I saw a different shine in her. Seeing the difference in Yolanda made Billy desire a better relationship with God. He committed to reading scripture each day. Wednesday, September 11, 2013, it said, today I give you a choice between life and death, prosperity or adversity. God was like giving you the answer to a multiple choice because he says, choose life because I got something for you, choose life. And I tell you, the, the scripture shocked me. 10 days later, he was involved in a motorcycle accident and critically injured. His doctors thought they would have to amputate his crushed leg. I remember waking up in the hospital. I remember screaming to the top of my lungs, I choose life, I choose life. Whatever you want me to do, I choose life. And that was when God healed me. Nearly two weeks later, Billy was released. Doctors were able to save his leg. Billy says God healed him in more ways than he expected. Instantly, I lost weight. The craving for the alcohol was gone. He took that away from me. My blood pressure was high, it's gone. And God, his presence was with me. All he needed was my answer. All I had to do was follow his direction. For six months, Billy recovered at home while his relationship with God and Yolanda got stronger. Each day, it got better and better and better. We remembered what love was. We, we remembered um, the importance of love, and love is about serving each other and being there for each other. So that's what we did for each other. Billy and Yolanda keep God at the heart of their marriage. They say that's the key to the joy and peace they share now. They founded Live in Peace Ministries, through which they counsel couples. They also share their story and marriage advice in their book, I The Wed. Our marriage is dedicated, obedient, and on fire. Uh, and it's on fire for what the Lord has us doing. And, and we wake up every day just ready to go and help other couples get through what we've gone through. When you really surrender to God and allow Him to lead your life, He will just really blow your mind in what He has in store for you. Now that we trust Him, He has blessed us beyond what we can imagine. wonderful to see how God has impacted their relationship. You know, that story is about all of us, really, isn't it? I mean, we set about trying to fix ourselves or fix somebody else so that we can have what we want. And once in a while, we throw a kind of perfunctory prayer up to God and say, could, could you just bless me? Could you bless this? But we don't really surrender to Him. You know, Yolanda said earlier in that story something that's really significant. She said, I surrendered and I didn't take it back. <laughs> That's a process for most of us, isn't it? You know, we give it to God and then we take it back and we try to control it or fix it. And then we give it to God. And, you know, there is a thing in Alcoholics Anonymous as saying that, you know, you need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired before you can get better. And that's true for us in every area of our life, I think. It's, it's how we get to surrender. We get sick and tired of fixing it ourselves. We get sick and tired of trying to control somebody else's choices. And then we finally let go and let God. 
that's God's invitation to you today. You know, maybe you are someone who is struggling in your marriage, as so many of us have, trying to fix the other person so they can meet your needs, so that your marriage can be what you dreamed it would be, and you're all about trying to make that happen. And most of the time, we have to stop and say, God, would you change me? Would you fix me? Would you take care of the things in me that aren't measuring up? And it means taking our focus off of the other person or the problem and just opening our hearts and surrendering to God. Maybe today you're on Bill's, Billy's side. Maybe you're addicted to something. You don't want to be. I don't think anybody after a window of time with addiction is happy with where they are. They just don't know how to get out of it. You know, there's only one way to get out of it, and that's to give it to Jesus Christ. If you and I had the ability to do that, we wouldn't be addicted in the first place. So today, let's do what both Billy and Yolanda did. Let's just say, God, I'm done. I want to surrender this to you. I give you my life. I give you my addiction. I give you my marriage. I give you me. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Savior of my soul and the Lord of my life. Keep me from taking it back. I don't want to take it back. I give it to you. I want to climb up on the altar, and I want to lay down before you and say, take my life and make something out of it that matters to you, something that matters to others, something that matters in my own walk and in my own family. I surrender to you, Jesus. Will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Will you teach me your ways? Will you change the way I think and the way I see other people? Give me a tender heart and ears to hear your voice when you speak to me. Listen, when you come before the Lord like that, he shows up. Jesus said he came to set the captive free. That's you and me until we know him. Today, if you need to talk with someone about a specific stronghold in your life or a specific need that you have, we want you to know that we're here to pray with you. Our number is even toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. If you're struggling in your marriage, when you call, ask for this. It's a little pamphlet called Love and Marriage. We want to tell you what God has to say in his word about marriage. It's something he created that's supposed to be a blessing. And then we've got a packet called A New Day. If this is you committing your life to Jesus Christ and you're saying, okay, I've prayed that prayer, now what do I do? Ask for a new day. It's put, been put together just for you. And it talks about how do we follow Jesus? What does a life committed to him look like? These are both free and they're yours for the asking when you call our toll-free number. So call now. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a 12-year-old baseball player has a freak accident on his family's farm. There was a bolt sticking out of the PTO shaft that got caught and ripped the shirt and jacket off of him and ripped his arm off. See the miracle that got this boy slugging again. That's coming up later. Welcome back to the 700 Club. British officials say two people have been critically injured by a Russian nerve agent. Investigators are seeking clues after the two were exposed to the Soviet military-grade substance Novichok. The couple fell critically ill a few miles from where a former Russian spy and his daughter were poisoned with the substance in March. Britain blamed Russia for that attack. UK police are unsure if there is a link between those two cases. A protester was arrested after a dramatic July 4th standoff at the Statue of Liberty. The woman climbed up the base of the statue and then held police at bay for hours, forcing thousands of tourists to evacuate the monument. Her display was a protest of President Trump's immigration policy. She declared she wouldn't come down until all the children are released. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of today's 700 Club right after this. Well, Greg and Stacy Radel liked helping other people. It's one of the things that motivated them to join the military. Well, they're both retired now, and they're still helping people all over the world without even leaving their living room. Ever since they met, retired Air Force Master Sergeants Greg and Stacy Radel shared the desire to serve. 
When they married in 2007, they made serving God their priority. But when it came to tithing, it wasn't so easy. You think of all the worldly things that you can use that money for, you know, and it's like, I don't know if I can, if I can do that. But, you know, the conviction came. And as you're getting into the Word, it's like Malachi 3, 10 says, He wants your whole tithes for the storehouse and then to trust Him. So out of obedience, they started tithing to their church. They adjusted to their new budget and before long, received promotions and bonuses at work. God just opened that door. And I think He knew that we had our giving hearts. As the Radles saw how giving made a difference in their lives and others, they wanted to serve people around the world. They saw CBN doing just that. So they became 700 Club Gold Partners. The first thing that always drew my attention was the fact that I could get the Christian view on the news. But then, you know, they would show where they were going in and they had the orphanages or they were putting well water in somewhere and giving people surgery who couldn't afford it or couldn't get the medical attention that they needed. So then that's what really drew me to want to give to CBN. All of it touches my heart. Whenever we can support something that, that helps people, and gives them the Word of God, that just makes the day. When there are disasters, or there are earthquakes or floods, they're, they're there, and I wanted to be a part of that. Greg and Stacy have found that service through giving is quite satisfying. It's very meaningful that I know that the money that we're giving is gonna go to worthy causes. It's nice to be able to, to give and know that CBN is actually going in and not only helping, but giving people the Word of God while they're over there. I know I'm being obedient to what God wants me to do, and just when you're obedient to Him, He takes care of you. He will take care of you if you just trust Him. And one of His names is El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One, where He will be your provider. Uh, and, and what does it take to walk into that revelation? Trust Him. It's the only time we get to test God. It's with our tithes and offerings. Prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. If, if you're not a regular tither, I encourage you to start today. Just see what will happen to you if you just say, I'm going to set aside 10% of my income. I'm going to give that to God. See what He will do for you. He will bless you beyond measure. That's His promise. Uh, this isn't some kind of prosperity gospel. This is what the Bible says. Bible says He will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. Sometimes that blessing is material. Sometimes it's uh, spiritual. Sometimes it's in your family. But if you want blessings from God, just obey His Word. If you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. We can't all go, but we can all be part of sending. Uh, and you can be a part of preaching the gospel around the world. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of CBN International to do just that. You also help people very tangibly through the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion of every gift goes into the work of uh, OB to help people very tangibly around the world. So if you want to be a part of all of it, call us and join 1-800-700-7000. When you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. And when you join at a level of $20 or more a month, uh, we'll send to you this wonderful teaching CDs, Power for Life. You'll get them on a monthly basis. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call or just log on to CBN.com, and when you give monthly on the Internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. So call now or go to CBN.com. Terry? Well, up next, a dad arrives on the scene of his young son's accident. The thing that really hits me is that he's just yelling. I just want to see Jesus. And I said, you don't want to die, buddy. You're going to be okay. See the race against time to save this boy and his severed arm when we come back. Seth Apel is an avid baseball player. 
One day, the 12-year-old's pitching arm got caught in a piece of machinery, and it was literally ripped from his body. The pain was so great that Seth begged to die. But he survived, and what happened next is nothing short of a jaw-dropping miracle. November 7, 2015, EMT Joe Smader responds to a 911 call to a home in rural Pennsylvania. He arrives to find 12-year-old Seth Apel lying on the ground, bleeding from where his right arm used to be. Said, I want to die. I'm a baseball player. I'm a pitcher. And I said, you don't want to die, buddy. You're going to be OK. Seth had been dumping firewood using a trailer that runs off the tractor's power takeoff, or PTO. It was still running when Seth tried using a stick to fix a gear chain on the trailer that had come loose. It was the last thing he remembers. It was a freak accident. There was a bolt sticking out of the PTO shaft. It got caught and ripped the shirt and jacket off of him, and ripped his arm off. Seth's grandfather came out when he heard the screams and called 911. Less than a mile away, Seth's dad, Josh, was still cutting firewood, unaware of what had happened. And that's when I just started walking down the hill. And that's when I saw my father-in-law coming up the hill. He said, it's Seth, something happened. At the time, Seth's mother, Angie, was at a friend's house 30 minutes away. I knew something was wrong, and all she said was, it's Seth, it's Seth. But I couldn't get out of her what had happened or what was wrong. During the whole drive, I was praying, God, tell me he's alive. God, tell me he was alive. And the voice that I, that I heard God saying, everything's going to be OK, that's all I could get. I'm like, no, I don't want that, because I know that, you know, in the end. Everything's going to be OK, but I want to know that he's going to be alive. By now, the ambulance had taken Seth and his severed arm to a designated landing zone to await a helicopter. Josh arrived moments later. The thing that really hits me is he's just yelling. I just want to see Jesus. That's. You know, that's always screaming. He's like, no, I just want to go see Jesus. As Angie got off the interstate, she saw the helicopter, a sign that God had answered her prayer. And I just started praising God because I knew that if there was a helicopter, he wasn't dead. Soon after she arrived, the chopper left for Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh with Seth and his dad on board. Now they were in a race against the clock to save the boy's arm. Plastic surgeon Lorelei Grundwald had been called in to assist in the surgery. I think what first went through my head was that the nerves were torn. When the nerves are stretched or torn, technically the patient isn't a great candidate for replantation. As the staff rushed Seth into the OR, Josh did what he could. I go through my phone, I start texting everyone that, you know, Seth was in an accident. It's pray for him. You know, within hours, you know, you, hundreds of people are, you know, saying that they're praying. In the operating room, the consensus of the surgical team was that the damage to Seth's arm was too extensive to be reattached. Dr. Grunwald was the exception. In my heart, in my mind, I felt there was greater than a 50% chance of it, of it being successful. So we sort of debated a little bit, and I said, you know, I really thought it was, was worth a shot. It wasn't until Angie arrived two hours later that a surgeon came out to tell them what they were attempting. Our jaws kind of hit the floor. You, you did what? You reattached, you know, and, and then it was, so we had something more specific than to pray for. By now, word was getting out on social media, and thousands of people were praying. In surgery, doctors worked to repair the thousands of severed blood vessels, nerves, and arteries. After six hours, they had successfully reattached Seth's arm. 
The first 48 hours were critical, and all the family could do was wait and pray. It was just God. I mean, that's, it's funny until you're in that situation, you don't think you'd have the strength, but he gives it to you. Seth woke up 24 hours later with a Bible scripture, Philippians 4.13, on his mind. And they asked me how I was feeling and all that, and I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I didn't realize his faith was so strong. So I was just very, very proud of him. I knew, I know that he has a determined spirit. The 48-hour mark passed, and it was clear the surgery had been a success. Three weeks later, Seth was released and started physical therapy. He worked hard because there was something he wanted to do. It didn't matter to Seth that he couldn't use his right hand. He just found a way around it. And six months after surgery, he stepped up to the plate for his team. Now batting number 48, Seth Papel. I just swung and I just started running. And I really pushed me, but I got there and I realized I'm on base. All right, and I'm like, let's win this. And we ended up winning that game. Honestly, I, I think I believed from the beginning. Um, you know, I just had this sense that, that this could work. Seth continues to improve, and he's still working on his game. Seriously, I mean, that's, well, that's only God can do that. You know, that's just amazing. Trust in him and follow him, then he'll get you through it. It doesn't matter what the consequence is or what's going on. If you keep your eyes focused on him, you can do everything through Christ. Out of the mouths of babes, he's declaring the praise of the Lord because what's happened for Seth could only have happened with God's grace, with God's power, with God's provision. And that's true for whatever your need is today. And I know many of you are watching the program and have needs, and we want to encourage your faith with some more reports before we pray together. Gordon, this is Betsy who lives in Cypress, Texas. She had polio when she was 13 years old. And over the years, she broke her back four times and had degeneration of the spine. She was in constant pain. On September 4th of this year, she was watching this program. And Gordon, you gave this word of knowledge. You've got deteriorating vertebrae in your spine. You're just losing calcium and losing the cushioning between the vertebrae. You're in constant pain. God's able to restore. So he's restoring bone to you now. He's restoring cartilage to you. He's restoring all of the things that you need to be pain free in Jesus name. Now, do what you couldn't do before. You couldn't rotate that spine without pain. Do it now and just see what God has done for you. He's releasing it now. Betsy moved her back and the pain was gone and she has been oh. pain free <laughs> ever since. Boy, these are some amazing miracles. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. that an amazing. Whew. That takes me back to the very first miracle I ever saw. Uh, I was preaching in a tiny little church in India and a boy who had polio. Wow. As an, uh, as an infant, never walked. He got up and walked. We, wow. we serve a mighty God. Here's Tina from San Jose, California. She had terrible pain in her hip. Doctors could not fo find any cause. She was watching the 700 Club. Terry, you said this, someone with a hip issue, your hip actually pops out of joint and it's so unexpected and so painful. God has touched and strengthened and healed that right now, and it's not going to happen again. Well, immediately, I love this, immediately, the pain in Tina's hip went away, and she's had no pain since that day. That was a wonderful story. In the middle of all of that, that young boy's crying out, I just want to see Jesus. I just want to see him. Uh, I want this pain to go away. I want this all to stop. I, want, I just want to see him. The amazing thing was God wanted something different. He wanted people to see Jesus in that little boy. He wanted the miracle. Realize that that's for you. God wants to show other people Jesus in you. The Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. We've done a lot to make it back into word, but no, God wants the word to become flesh in you. Well, here's what the word says. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now start thinking about how big anything is. That's really big, anything. So we're going to agree, we're going to agree for you. And no matter what the doctors say, realize God wants to make his word flesh in you. He sent his word and healed our disease. Let's pray. Lord, we lift the audience to you right now and those who are suffering, those who are in hospitals, those who have infirmities, those who had childhood illnesses that linger, those who are suffering with cancer, those who are suffering with pulmonary problems, heart problems. Lord, whatever the problem is, we lift it to you now and we ask that you would stretch forth your hand to do miracles today, to do mighty miracles, that the word would become flesh again in them and that your glory would be revealed in them. So Lord, we agree now and we reach out in faith and we touch it and we say out loud to it, be healed in Jesus' name and be completely restored. So a man named Tom and you're suffering with lung cancer and you've kind of given up hope. But the God of all hope is coming to you right now. He's called you by name. It's in both lungs and there's pain and pain with every breath. God is healing you right now. Just take a big, big deep breath and realize that pain just left you. He's able to turn cancer into normal cells. He's doing it for you right now in Jesus' name. Terry? There's somebody else you have um, struggled with torn retina issues and not once. Uh, you have a sensitivity there, but God is just restoring that. He's healing it. You'll not have it again. Your vision will be restored. Someone else, you, you have chronic um, intestinal issues and you'll know this is you because it's not one condition. You have multiple conditions, but God is setting you free right now. Feel that warmth in your belly as God just heals you completely in Jesus name someone with a blockage in your right kidney and the tube that comes out of the kidney and it's very painful for you and you're just asking for a miracle right now. Mm -hmm. That blockage is dissolving and leaving you now. Pain be gone now in Jesus name. Amen and amen. If you've been touched by God, we want to share your miracle with the world. So call us. Let us know the story. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Luke. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. For all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.